Thank you very much, Edith. Thank you, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first visit to Konas. I mean, I've known Vitus for many years, and, and we have often spoken about the possibility of my visiting Konas. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity now, and also to talk about issues which are both important for us as human beings and as scholars, and which raises challenges for anthropology. Because when I started to look into the contemporary changes that have been taking place in our world at an enormous speed in the last, say, 20, 25 years, um, it struck me that, yes, there is a huge literature on globalization, but some of it is a bit unsatisfactory for anthropologists because it's superficial at the level of the lived life in local communities. You know, books about globalization, they, they're very good at painting the big picture often. Things which are happening at a very large scale uh, level, uh, but uh, have little to say about the lives in communities. And as anthropologists and ethnologists, we know that life in small communities is diverse. It differs. People respond in different ways to global changes. And some people are more affected than others by the global changes. And then you have the anthropological literature on globalization, which sometimes has the opposite problem. Um, because uh, anthropological books about globalization are often really good at talking about small communities, but very often do not connect life in these small communities in a satisfactory way to the, to the larger scale. So what we have been trying to do in this research project called Overheating, and you'll find it online. We have uh, some materials on the web, uh, some interviews, some little articles. We even have an, a, a free uh, e-book that can be downloaded called Knowledge and Power in an Overheated World, which I edited with my colleague Elizabeth Schauber last year, a free e-book. But the rest of, I mean, some of the other stuff you'll have to buy, okay? Uh, it's not free, but it's not very expensive. I mean, uh, we're trying to uh, find publishers which, uh, which can uh, put out affordable books. So what we've been trying to do, and this has been going on for the last five, six years, overheating, the Overheating Project, is to connect lives in local communities with these large-scale uh, uh, global questions. And what I'm hoping to, uh, to discuss with you later on is just how do people respond in different communities to these uh, large-scale uh, changes? Now, what are these large-scale changes? Well, it seems to me, and I'm going to argue, and you may not agree, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with disagreement, okay, that something happened to acceleration in the early 1990s. Modernity has always been associated with change. And change in modernity is often considered a good thing because it's associated with growth, development, progress. This is a kind of ideology which really uh, caught on in the early 19th century, around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Lots of things started to change very rapidly in the world, and not just in Europe, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, say around the yeah, early 19th century. Uh, with the uh, marriage of coal and the steam engine, okay, coal and the steam engine, which really s s set things moving. Um, the uh, population of the world, now that's my first, I mean, I don't really need these uh, graphs because they all look the same, okay? <laughs> they all sort of point upwards in a, in a rather exponential way. <clears throat> Population started to grow really rapidly around the uh, time of the Industrial Revolution. Consider that it had taken humanity 200,000 years to reach the first billion. We were, about first, we were about one billion people at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which was also the time when uh, industrialization really started to take off. <coughs> with, with the train, with the uh, with the new uh, methods of production, um, with a steamboat, all of a sudden you could travel to the United States from Europe within weeks rather than months, and you could know roughly when you arrived. 
because you have the steam boat. You, you were not dependent anymore on, uh, on winds. Um, um, and uh, improvements in health started to, to take on. So uh, it took us 200,000 years as anatomically modern humans to reach the first billion. From then, it took only 100 years to reach the second billion, right? From, uh, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars to the beginning of the First World War. We were two billion. And from, uh, the, from the time we were two billion, it only took us another 100 years to reach seven and a half billion. Okay, more than a trebling in 100 years. So this happened really quickly, um, uh, this acceleration of population growth. And not only did the number of people in the world grow very quickly in those last, say, 200 years, but so has life expectancy, which is something that we rarely reflect upon. And we should probably think more about the implications of longevity, of life expectancy. Uh, throughout human history, typically, life expectancy had been between 30 and 40 years. So if you reached 40, you were lucky. And then you might actually become 50 and 60 you know, before, you, before you threw the towel in. But uh, on an average, people lived between 30 and 40 years. And this had been the sort of the, the norm throughout the history of humanity. And since then, since in the last 200 years, population uh, um, has not only uh, grown by a factor of seven and a half, but life expectancy has also doubled. So that even in fairly poor countries, even in sub-Saharan African countries, people now have a longer life expectancy than they did in Europe before the First World War. Life expect I mean, I'm 56, okay? Um, and... Uh, I would have been dead, okay? As they always say, when Mozart was, when I was, when Mozart was my age, he had been already dead, you know, for 20 years. Um, uh, so um, uh, we now live around, you know, 70, 80 years in some countries, between 60 and 70 years in others, but far longer than they did before. And we use more energy, right? Well, this is world population development. That's just another developing countries, industrialized countries. You see how in the, the uh, industrialized countries, uh, population growth is slow. In developing countries, it's fast. I'm not going into that here, but that's a, a fact with serious implications for this century, for the 21st century. So this, this is the, um, uh, the, the, the slightly longer term, uh, okay, the 200 last uh, years, um, since uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We spend... Uh, more than 30% more energy. We use more than 30%, uh, no, sorry, more than 30 times as much, much energy as we did 200 years ago. So population has grown by a factor of seven and a half. Energy consumption has grown by a factor of 30. And most of this energy is non-renewable. So we're eating up the capital, in a sense. It's a kind of destruction. We're destroying um, uh, energy that it has taken the planet more than 60 million years to produce, fossil fuels. And you know all about the side effects of this as well in the, in, in, in the realm of environment, climate change, and so on. It's fairly serious. Anyway, the last 200 years. But what about the last 25 years, which is what overheating focuses on? Uh, my uh, assumption is that acceleration, which has always been part of modernity, as I say. Change has always been part of modernity. Things have always gone faster. There has been this idea of progress and development uh, associated with change has accelerated. That acceleration has accelerated in the last 25 years, since the early 1990s. All of a sudden, things are changing much more quickly than they did before, um, in a number of, of realms. And how do we relate to this? Yeah, this is just one typical graph of internet. You know, uh, I wrote a book in 2006 called Globalization, The Key Concepts. And I wrote, I mean, there was something there about information technology. I was saying that, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, information technology is spreading really fast. People have internet access. But in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, people on the whole don't really have access to the internet. Because um, outside of South Africa, which has a different history, which has been industrial for, for many years, Africans didn't really have access to internet in 2006, between 2 and 3% of the population had access to the internet. And then it was just as if I had just gone out and had a cup of coffee, returning to the office. And when I returned to the office, the figure had changed. All of a sudden, it was 10%. And the next time, it was 15 
And when I had to revise the book for the second edition in 2014, just after eight years, uh, the proportion of Africans with access to the internet was somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. So this has happened in less than 10 years. It's fairly dramatic. And what does this entail? What does it imply uh, for Africans that they now have, obviously they don't have laptops and computers, but they have smartphones. They have cheap smartphones from China. And they can access the net, they can have uh, their Facebook account, they can send um, all sorts of messages, they can be online uh, uh, for the first time in history. So this is, uh, um, that's one, one, one example, I mean, of, of uh, accelerated change, which is very obvious to you because in 1990 the internet hardly existed. So it's not exactly news to you that, uh, the, uh, that the spread of the internet has been very fast since the early 1990s. But let's look at another example. Because we see this tendency of overheating. I'll explain the term overheating in a minute. Okay? It's not just about climate change. It's about other things as well. Uh, but let me just give you a few more examples. International tourist arrivals. As early as the late 1970s, there were people in Northern Europe who were complaining that Spain, certain parts of Spain, were being ruined by tourism because there were too many tourists there and it was no longer authentically Spanish. You know, you could go to Malaga or to Majorca and you could walk into a, an Irish pub, you know, uh, and you could uh, eat fish and chips and watch English football. Um, and you could walk into a, a grocery uh, in, in Palma de Mallorca and you can buy your Dutch newspaper or your Scandinavian rolling tobacco. So it seemed as if it was no longer authentically Spanish. Swedish meatballs in Spain, you know, horrible. But this, I mean, <laughs> late 1970s, 1979, the total number of tourist arrivals in Spain was just 14 million. And at the latest count in 2016, it was above 60 million. So it's been a fourfold increase in just a generation. And this is a global phenomenon. There's been a five-fold increase, in fact, globally in the last generation from around 200 million international tourist arrivals <coughs> sorry, <coughs> in, uh, in 1980 to more than a billion. They talk about 1.2 billion uh, in 2017. It's fairly dramatic. And it also, uh, it's also quite interesting that uh, just in the last couple of years, after I completed writing the overheating book, so it's not in there. People in several tourist destinations have started to complain about the influx of tourists. And you have local action groups which try to prevent the negative effects of tourism. I mean, people, Italians, can no longer afford to live in Venice. And if you could, you wouldn't be able to get a table in a restaurant. And if you could get a table in a restaurant, you'd discover that they only serve pizzas and, you know, cheap, horrible stuff. Uh, and, they, and they charge you an, an enormous price for it because it's intended for tourists, not for locals. People in Dubrovnik in the, in the, on the Adriatic Sea they sometimes feel as if they live in an outdoor museum. Whenever they leave their house, there would be a throng of Chinese or Japanese or American or Germans with their, with their mobile phones, okay, taking pictures of them uh, because they're uh, authentic locals. And they just want to live their lives. They don't want to live in an outdoor museum. So you have this kind of, of action. And it's becoming impossible for students to get a good room in Barcelona because it's so expensive. Again, because of tourism. So we have all these sort of interesting local counter-reactions against uh, the influx of tourists. As an example uh, of, of, a, of a response to overheating. Oh, I mentioned mobile phones. Uh, another example, which I, I, don't, I don't have a, a graph for that, but I could, it, it looks like this. Uh, did you know that only in the space of five years, from 2010 to 2015, the number of photos taken in the world trebled? It went from 0 0.35 trillion to 1 trillion. Now, I don't know how much a trillion is, okay? <laughs> I don't even know how many zeros there are. But there's a lot of pictures, a lot of photos. Uh, and it's easy to understand why this happened, because... Um, Nowadays, most photos are taken with mobile phones. And everybody has a smartphone. And the cameras are getting better. So, I mean, I've noticed that in my family. We no longer necessarily bring our big, bulky, heavy camera on holiday. Because we've got our mobile phones. And we take pictures with them. Uh, so it's easy to, to describe what's happened with this trebling. 80% of the 
of the photos taken in the world are now taken with mobile phones. And uh, before 2010, it was more like 20%. And this has happened like this, you know, it happened since yesterday. So we understand what's happened, but we do not yet understand what this does to our ability to uh, uh, understand pictures and to read pictures when pictures are all over the place and they're cheap and they're disposable and they're on Snapchat and they only last for so long and you've got to have hundreds of them and, uh, and maybe you get a, a few likes for uh, a half a dozen, okay, when you, when you post a few hundred photos. Uh, it was sometimes said in the past, in the dim and distant past when I was a young man, you know, when photos were rare and expensive and it was cumbersome and it took ages because you needed, you know, first you took the picture and you didn't know how it turned out because the, the, the cameras were not digital, right? So you had no idea what the, cam what the photo looked like and half of them would be fail failures, you know, there would be something wrong with the light or the focus or whatever. And you had to deliver the film, right, to have it developed in a laboratory. And it could take a week or two before you got your pictures. And it was quite expensive. So maybe you took just one roll of photos, 36 or 24 uh, pictures when you were on holiday. And then you could have a look at them. And you really poured over the pictures to see which you could put into the album, which had to be thrown away, which one you could give to your mother, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they used to say at the time that one picture says more than a thousand words. And I sometimes now wonder if, it, if we shouldn't turn that on its head in this overheated, image-saturated era. One word says more than a thousand pictures. We just have to find the right word. And that's why we have poetry. That's what the poets are trying to do. Anyway, so tourist arrivals, photos. I said energy consumption, still going up. Yeah, this is the urban proportion. That's also quite interesting. The urbanization of the world. Um, in certain parts of the world, we now see the emergence of urban agglomerations of people in, 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 with, with names that you and I would never have heard about, and they may contain several million people, right? I mean, huge sort of urban um, concentrations of people. Now, um, most of these people live in the global south. I mean, it's a, there's a very clear distinction here between uh, south and north regarding the, the, the speed of change in urbanization. Yeah, I mean, the cities in the north also grow, but they grow very slowly. I don't know about Kornos, I mean, about the historical statistics, but I would assume that Kornos grows, but grows slowly. Uh, when I was starting to take notes for this chapter in the overheating book about, uh, about cities and about urbanization, uh, I happened to be in Göttingen in Germany, which is a very old city. Uh, somehow, it seems as if Göttingen has had a continuous urban population since the Roman era. So it's, it's one of the older sort of continuous cities, as it were, in, 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 in continental Europe. And it now has between 70 and 80,000 inhabitants. So it's taken it 2,000 years yeah, to grow to a size of 70 to 80,000. And the infrastructure has somehow kept a pace with the, uh, with the growth of population so that there is electricity, there's water, there's sewerage. I mean, you have all the, uh, all the infrastructural uh, facilities that you need to cater for that population. Now you know what I'm going to say. Compare this with Lagos, Nigeria, uh, or with Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil, or compare it with, uh, with, uh, with Nairobi, Kenya. Or let's say, okay, let me just give you a couple of examples to illustrate what I'm saying. Nouakchott, which is the capital of Mauritania, the western tip of West Africa, northwest Africa. Morit uh, uh, Nouakchott was built by the French in the 1950s uh, as part of the colonial endeavor. Right? It was, the idea was that they needed a trading post and an administrative center for that particular part of French West Africa. And maybe a place where nomads could come in from the, from the desert, you know, and water their camels, have a shower, sell some camel meat and, and, and stuff that they'd made, and, and buy grains and other foodstuffs that they needed. So that was the idea. So Nouachot was designed for a population of up to 50,000 people, 50,000. With uh, the roads, buildings, you know, uh, public services, etc., for a population of 50,000. And now again, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> 
Nowadays, uh, 50 years on, Nouakchott has a population of at least 2 million. Nobody knows how many live there, but at least 2 million, with virtually the same infrastructure. So if you see uh, uh, you know, films or articles from African cities or African slums where people are standing in the line with water buckets to fill, the, fill up the buckets, you know why. Because they, they don't have piping, they don't have a, a, a water supply which is adjusted to the, to the new size of the population. In some, I, I, could, I could go on and talk about urbanization, but let me just say one, one more thing. That's, that's just one illustration of the uncontrolled, phenomenal, overheated growth of cities in the global south. And most of these people live in what most uh, people call slums, and what anthropologists maybe tend to call informal settlements. But it's the same thing. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and we shouldn't romanticize the life in an informal settlement or a slum. It's, 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 a hard, it's a hard life. It's a difficult life. Uh, and it is uh, argued that uh, the, the, the entire stretch, if you think about Africa looking a bit like this, the entire stretch sort of in the armpit of Africa, from, from Benin City in Nigeria to Accra, the capital of Ghana, covering four countries, uh, there's now a continuous urban population, a continuous slum, right? Uh, fairly dramatic, and it has been said by you know, urban scholars that probably in this area you have the, the highest concentration of, uh, of human misery in the world. Um, not an easy life, um, but that's how it is. So urbanization, phenomenal, very fast. Yeah, yeah, slum population trends, I don't have to go into this. And just a few other examples of overheating, number of cars, still growing with its uh, obvious environmental side effects. Um, energy, which is crucial. As you can see, coal is still champion, although there's a bit more oil, but not much. And coal is growing, and it's growing quickly, and it has grown since this statistics was made. Again, uh, when I started to get interested in these things, in trying to sort out uh, the implications of accelerated change in the world. I, I understood that I had to read up on coal. Um, and we can talk more about that later on, because the coal lies at the heart of the uh, main contradiction of contemporary world civilization. Coal was the salvation of humanity for 200 years. It brought us out of poverty, misery. It brought us the kind of lifestyle that we're enjoying today. With electricity, with comfortable houses, with heated houses in winter. You know, you live in a cold place, I live in a cold place, and you know what that means, to have a smoke-free, light, warm house where you can sort of go inside in January when it's minus 20 outside. Before the cold, this was far more difficult. Houses were dark, they were smoke-filled, and they were often cold, uh, and so on and so forth. And coal has also given us energy slaves, energy slaves. We don't need to have slaves anymore because we have machinery. And, it, and the coal is at the bottom of it. And its younger cousins, uh, gas and oil. Coal is not going out of fashion. But it has slowly dawned upon us that what was our salvation for 200 years is now becoming our damnation. Because it's running out and because of climate change. Because of the side effects of, of the fossil fuels. But coal has not go, gone out of fashion. When I started to read up on this, um, a few years ago, Australia was the largest coal exporter in the world, okay? The major coal, main coal exporter in the world. And I started to read up, and I started to plant feedwork in Australia. But then again, I went out to have a drink, came back to the office, turned on my computer, checked the statistics, and all of a sudden, while I've been out, it had been overtaken by Indonesia. This happened, well, it didn't happen while I had coffee, but you see what I mean. It happened in just the space of a few years. Indonesia, which had been a non-entity, in the world of fossil fuels uh, had all of a sudden become the world's largest coal exporter. And most of that coal goes to Japan and China, mainly China, actually. The world's largest coal exporter. Imagine what this means to people who live in Indonesia, indigenous people, other groups who live in those areas. All of a sudden, they have, uh, they're surrounded by enormous <coughs> open pit coal mines. And they wonder what's going on. Of course you do. You wonder what's going on. And that's the, the anthropological uh, question that needs to be asked. I'm not painting the big picture. 
And I'll return, I'll come to the small picture eventually, or rather the small pictures. What, how do people in different communities respond to these accelerated changes? When things are happening really fast, and you wonder what's going on, and if something goes wrong in your life because of these changes, because your life changes, and you lose some of your options, and you lose some of your freedom, you ask yourself, who can I blame? And what can I do? And this used to be easy. At the time of Marx and Engels, I don't know how much you celebrate Marx's, the, the 200th anniversary of Marx's birth here. You have a more amb amb ambivalent relationship to Marxism than, eh, than some people do in my country. So there have been some, uh, not so exactly celebration, but there have been some big newspaper articles about Marx in the last few days, 200 years since he was born. Um, and in Marx and Engels' time, when they wrote the Communist Manifesto in the late 1840s, it was fairly easy to know who to blame because it was the capitalist, the man who owned, it was always a man, who owned the factory. And he had a top hat and a cigar, you know, and a porch, you know, and he walked slowly and he had money with his walking stick, you know, he could walk around and, and give orders. So you knew who he was, he owned the factory. Whereas nowadays, where I've been working ethnographically recently in Australia, in an industrial city, a place which is marinated in fossil fuels on the Australian coast. I mean, if you have a complaint because of your health, because of industrial emission, because the fish are dying in the, in the harbour and that sort of thing, and that sort of thing happens where I've been working, uh, you could blame the, maybe the alumina refinery. It's the alumina refinery. But who to go to in the alumina refinery when it is owned by a conglomerate uh, that is, can, consists of 30% Chinese, you know, 24% uh, Indian, and there's also a bit of Australian there, the big mining giant Rio Tinto. So who exactly is responsible? Who can you blame when something goes wrong? I'll return to that in a little while, because that's a question that people are asking themselves in lots of places around the world. Who can I blame and what can I do? You know, should I blame the European Union and vote Brexit? Should I blame uh, those people in Washington and vote for Trump? You know, that's, I mean, that, that kind of question is being raised. And it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Uh, people are taking decisions without asking me for my opinion. And what can I do about that? Right. That's, that is a question. But I'm coming to that. I'm, um, uh, yeah, world per capita, you can see... It's also um, growing still at a fairly healthy rate, energy consumption. We're nowhere near the target of the Kyoto Agreement, uh, according to which we should reduce our carbon footprint uh, dramatically by 2030. And here you can see a number, of, a number of exponential growth curves, okay? Anything from population to the number of McDonald's restaurants. And, uh, and so on. So you can see that uh, all of these, these graphs, they basically look the same. Some of them start a bit earlier than the others, but they all look the same. So what was it that happened in the early 1990s? I'm saying that there was something that happened in the early 1990s, which led to the acceleration of acceleration. Global changes started to happen much faster than before. There were a number of things that happened. Now, let me just run through them. Orally, I don't have that on PowerPoint, I'm sorry. I'm not very good with PowerPoint. Um, it was the end of the Cold War. Yeah, I mean, it had been coming for a couple of years. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989, but 1991, as you know really well here in Lithuania, was the year in which the Soviet Union officially ceased to exist. Wow, thanks. I have some health issues. So I need blood, I need, not, not blood, I'm not a vampire, <laughs> uh, but a bit of sugar. Mm -hmm. I hope you're okay with that. Um, so, um, yeah, the end of the Cold War, which meant that all of a sudden nearly the entire world had become a single market. There was a strong ideology of deregulation of economies, free competition, <coughs> Protectionism became a bad word, and the market forces were allowed to, to, to rule. So uh, the integration of the world economy really took off in the early 1990s. 
And it was not just the end of the Cold War and the integration of Central Eastern Europe into the capitalist world that happened, but also the deregulation of the Indian economy during Rajiv Gandhi's uh, premiership. Indian economy had been a command economy. It had been a state, I mean, to a great extent, a socialist state economy you know, since independence in the late 40s. And suddenly, they, they were also uh, now part of the global market of, uh, of competitive capitalism. In China, Deng Xiaoping, the leader of China around that time, it was around that time that he gave his famous speech where he says that it doesn't really matter, the color of the cat doesn't really matter as long as it catches mice. In other words, whether we call it this, that, or the other, as long as it is able to remove us from poverty and create prosperity, we can use market forces, a more pragmatic approach to the economy. So, it, so the early 90s also marked the entry of the two largest or the most populous countries in the world, India and China, into the, into the capitalist world. So this happened at the level of markets. And at the same time, in the early 1990s, uh, we got these instantaneous um, ways of communicating through the internet and mobile phones. Mobile phones had existed in the 1980s, sort of, but they were about this big, you know? <laughs> so you, it was not like, you know, I wonder where I put my phone. I mean, you never asked that question. You knew where it was. You could use it to kill people. <laughs> I remember those. I mean, they were basically phones that people had in their cars. And you needed a transmitter, which filled half the trunk of the car, you know, in order to use it. And then you got small phones. You got Nokia, GSM. Uh, and by, by, the, by 1993, the world had changed quite dramatically. I mean, let me just illustrate to you. I mean, because we need, we need this historical memory in order to understand what kind of lives we live now and what kind of world we live in now. In the, uh, uh, we were, uh, Vitis and I were talking last night about the differences between doing anthropological fieldwork now and then. And then could just be 30 years ago. Because when I did my first fieldwork in the Indian Ocean in 1986, I was basically out of touch. I could send letters home. But it took a month before I got a response. I could phone my mum and say that I was still alive. But it was quite expensive and it took me half a day because I had to go into town. And there was one particular place, which was a sort of telecommunication centre, where I was able to make international phone calls. Uh, whereas five years later, six years later, I could phone home from underneath a coconut tree on a beach with my mobile phone. Imagine what this did to us. The, uh, the advent of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of, of that flexible, deterritorialized uh, way of communicating. So that when all of a sudden, when people ring each other up, they, uh, they, they started to ask each other, so where are you now? Where are you? In the past, before the early 90s, we never asked that question because we knew where people were. They were at home or in their office because you only had that landline phone, okay? So this happened. And the internet started to spread. So from 1991, Mr. and Mrs. Smith could walk into a shop and buy themselves a subscription to America Online, for example, to some kind of internet provider, which was not available before that time. It was around that time that we got internet at the university, where I work as well. So things started to happen really quickly. So these were some of the changes that took place in 1991, and which has led to this acceleration uh, that we have seen since. Some of the changes. OK, and um, yeah, this is about uh, environment. I'm, I'm not going into that now because I think we should uh, move on a bit to talk about the local responses. So in other words, there are accelerated changes. We see them in the realm of um, the economy changing very quickly, unpredictably. We see it in the realm of the environment and climate where we increasingly are becoming aware that there is something seriously wrong. I mean, we have so many now, what we could call canaries in the coal mines. I don't know if, you, if that's a familiar term to you, the canary in the coal mine. In the old days, when coal mines were underground, they're no longer underground because it's, more, it's cheaper and more efficient and easier to have huge machines just scraping off the surface and digging them, digging down to find the coal instead of having tunnels underground. So we have these huge sores and scars in landscapes uh, from Indonesia to Australia because of coal mines. But in the past, when coal mines were underground, uh, and there was a concern that there might not be enough oxygen, and if there wasn't enough oxygen, people would suffocate and die. They might have a, a canary in, in, a, in a cage in a coal mine, and if the canary died, 
you had to get up really quickly. So that's a canary in the coal mine. It's a symptom that something more serious is wrong. Uh, well, now here's about anything from the vanishing insects in Germany, in, you know, in a German national park. Um, it was announced earlier this year that about 70% of the insects were gone. It's, quite, it's quite, quite, quite serious, isn't it? The death of bees. Well, I mean, a bee colony collapse, which is a, uh, still a sort of a mystery, but everybody agrees that it has something to do with either artificial fertilizer or pesticides or, or, or uh, agriculture or you know, uh, some kind of human intervention, which kills off the bees. Now, couldn't we do without bees? No, we can't do without bees, because bees are necessary to pollinate flowers, fruit, almonds, oranges, etc. Um, anything from this to the news, which uh, has got quite a bit of attention in the last few months, uh, that uh, there's so much plastic in the sea now that uh, uh, it is predicted that by the year 2050 there will be more plastic than fish. Now, quite a bit of this plastic will actually be inside fish, and it will eventually be inside us because we eat fish, <laughs> right? Uh, and we don't know what that plastic is going to do to us because we haven't tried yet. Uh, right? So, so there is a lot of that kind of uncertainty. So you have that in the realm of, I said, finance, economy, volatile financial markets, crisis, bubbles, the financialization of the economy, that more and more of the economy is shifted from, say, you know, factories and material, as it were, um, wealth to, uh, to stocks and to expectations um, and to psychology makes it very unpredictable. When the American president gives a strange speech, it affects the stock exchange, right? Because it affects the psychology of investors and their expectations. So that also is unpredictable. And thirdly, a third major sort of family of crisis is to do with culture and identity, right? How can I be, how can we be the people we want to be in this swirl of global change and influence and uh, mobility and communication and mixing and hybridity and so on and so forth. How can we continue to be the persons and the communities that we want to be? And the big question is, how can we regain control of our own lives, which has been lost to a great extent? So I'm arguing now, I move to the, I, I'm now, I've now tried to persuade you Okay, that there have been some momentous changes in the world in the last, say, 25 uh, years. Um, an acceleration of acceleration with an unpredictable outcome. And before I move to the last part of this talk, okay, uh, a lengthy footnote. Not, not so lengthy, but uh, I'll, I'll give just a short footnote. I mentioned to you that a major contradiction or double bind in globalization, in the contemporary world, is to do with uh, the fact that what was our salvation for 200 years is now becoming our damnation, namely the availability of cheap and abundant and useful energy. And we're, still, we're trying to get our head around that. And there are many, you know, suggestions as to what we can do. Uh, and I've got my own, and you can ask me about that later on if you want to know. Um, but um, some, some believe in alternative energy sources, business as usual, but with sustainable energy, you know, solar energy, wind, whatever, nuclear, whatever, which is more sustainable. Uh, others believe that we really have to make some more dramatic changes in the way we live. Consumerism, consumerism has to go. Uh, we have to consume less, or we have to reduce population. There are all of these prospects. But what they all have in common is the conviction that the traditional narratives in modernity of progress, development, and growth are, uh, no longer have the uh, persuasive power that they used to. We no longer believe in progress the way we used to because we see so many side effects, unintended, cumulative side effects of the idea of progress. Uh, so in other words, overheating, which is about speed, uh, can be compared to... Um, a vehicle driving on the highway with no speed limit and without knowing where it's going, right? Because there's no direction. 
There's no end goal, as it were, as it used to be in the time of progress. Accelerated change, fast forward without a, a defined direction. So what is overheating? Well, it's about, it's about speed. You know, in physics, speed and heat are two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, molecules that uh, uh, move quickly heat up because of the friction, right? And in this part of the world, right, until, right up until last week, uh, when it suddenly started to heat up, at least where I live, you often rubbed your hands together like this. If you left your house in the winter months and you'd forgotten your gloves inside, okay, you rub your hands together like this, and they would warm up. And if you, could walk, if you could rub your hands together really, really quickly, they would eventually burn up, right? Because they would generate so much heat that they would turn into charcoal. But we have an internal thermostat that tells us, that tells our body, this is fine, this is enough. You can stop now because you're warm enough. So we don't burn up. And if we didn't have that thermostat, we'd be in trouble. That's, you know, the, the fever. Uh, the, 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 the accelerated uh, temperature change inside the body. The fever, that's why the fever can be so dangerous, because the thermostat somehow has ceased working owing to infections and other things. And my argument about overheating is that the world uh, is now comparable to someone who is rubbing their hands together really quickly, but without a thermostat, without an instance that can say, stop, it's enough. We're ruining the planet. We, we're undermining the conditions of our own existence. We're digging our own grave, etc. We're painting ourselves into a corner, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's nobody who has the authority to say that enough is enough. There isn't even agreement about the description of the situation. You know, to some people, <coughs> poverty is a big issue. Poverty, especially in South. Poverty and health in the global South. To some people, it's the environment, it's climate. We have to change the environment. To some people, it's politics. The withdrawal into uh, antagonistic group identities as a response, as a protective, uh, sort of self-defensive, but also quite aggressive response to, uh, to global change. So there's, there isn't even a, an agreement about the, uh, the description of uh, what the problem is. So in other words, uh, that's, that's where we are now. And how do people respond to this locally? Well, you know, can I go on for another 10 minutes? Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Great, yeah. So I'll, I'll continue for another 10 minutes. Um, you know, when we started out with the overheating project, we had sub-projects around the world. And we were all sort of trying to ask some of the same questions in order to make it a truly comparative effort. So that uh, I did my fieldwork in Australia, and I was comparing notes with my postdoc who was working in Peru, and with another postdoc working in the Philippines, and one working on right-wing uh, movements in Europe. Uh, and we used the word crisis quite a lot. I used the word crisis, read up on the literature on crisis. These are the crises of globalization. But then one of our PhD students, who was working in Sierra Leone, in West Africa, said that, you know, um, you know, Thomas, I mean, sometimes people are affected by these changes, and the changes come from outside. They're exogenous, as we say. They're not endogamous. They're not generated from inside. They come from outside. They come through Chinese investments or state interventions or uh, Australian mining companies or whatever. But sometimes people are quite happy about these changes. They're quite happy about them because they can produce peace and prosperity and stability in societies where they uh, formerly had nothing. And Sierra Leone in West Africa had just emerged from a bloody civil war, a horrible civil war, and they just got peace. So they were perfectly happy with Chinese investors and others coming in and starting activities. They didn't feel powerless as a result. They felt that this new situation gives us opportunities. So we should leave that option open. Not everybody uh, experiences uh, accelerated change as crisis. Quite a few people see the opportunities and the possibilities, but sometimes it's crisis, sometimes it's terrible. And how do we respond? Let me give you an example, also to illustrate the powerlessness many people feel, which maybe we can, some of those of you who are taking part after lunch, we can discuss afterwards. How do we respond 
how do people around the world and in different communities respond to the feeling of being powerless, the feeling that there is a real democratic deficit. There's a real democratic deficit. Democracy no longer functions for us. We've heard that, right? And you hear it from, uh, you hear it from all sorts of groups, and they're often right. I'm not saying that their solution is right. Okay? It may be that the diagnosis is right, but they sort of send it off to the wrong doctor. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, that there is a real democratic deficit and it's growing. And let me try to explain why I'm saying this and why that is a result of overheating. Overheating, um, an overheated global economy uh, leads to, or it entails, um, ec an economy of scale. So that uh, the, the bigger the better. You become more competitive, the more units you can produce, the larger your corporation is. Um, all other things being equal, a big corporation and big money will easily be able to outcompete the small money. And leads, this leads to, um, do I have that here? Yes, yeah, standardization. One of the points I'm making. Why is everything becoming the same? Well, everything is not becoming the same, but you see what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> uh, how McDonald's uh, is outcompeting the local burger joint, you know, run by the guy next door. Um, but at the level of political decision-making, let me give you two short examples. One of them is from Highland, Peru, in the, up in the Andes, where I, have a, um, I had a postdoc. She still has a postdoc because she was lucky. She had a couple of children, so she was able to extend her, her, her grant. Uh, so she's still working on this. Luckily for us, and luckily for us, for her. Um, and she works on water. Her main interest is water, and the shortage of water privatization of water. Water used to belong to everyone. Suddenly, uh, you, you get companies which try to privatize it, to sell water to people, which wasn't a commodity in the past. Uh, and not least, uh, the erratic and unpredictable supply of water these days. The rains are not coming when they're supposed to. The melting uh, tropical glaciers in the Andes uh, have been melting in such a way that they no longer are as useful as they were for irrigating your crops. You know, in, in one of these villages, there was a mountain which everybody could sort of, which was an iconic, as it were, mountain for the region. And they called it La Ponchita Blanca, the small white poncho, because it, was, it had a small poncho, a white poncho on top, right? It was snow capped. They can no longer call it La Ponchita Blanca now because the snow cap is gone and it's probably not going to return. You know, just like, I mean, the Arctic. And uh, Arctic and subarctic areas, uh, tropical uh, mountains and tropical uh, glaciers are some of the areas where we see climate change uh, most clearly, where it's happening most quickly. So people in the village or in the town uh, felt that, you know, that something's wrong with our water supply. And they immediately started to suspect a mining company that had set up an operation nearby. Because mines are notorious for using water. They pump out water, I mean, they, they mess up water, they divert streams, they do all sorts of stuff when they dig their big holes in the ground. So they went to the mining company and said, look, I mean, uh, you've taken our water away. We need compensation. Give us money or, you know, or, or give us some water as a, as a replacement for the water you've taken. And the people from the mining company came out and they said, you know, we feel sorry for you. I mean, we really, you have our sympathy, but it's not us, you see. It's global climate change. And what do you do then? You know, who can you blame and what can you do? I mean, keep that question at the back of your mind. Who can I blame and who can I, who can I blame? Who can I trust and what can I do? If that is true, it's global climate change. Well, they could always send an email to Obama, you know, who was still then president in the United States and who was a literate president who knew about climate change and like the one they have now. Um, so uh, they could send an email to Obama and say, look, Mr. Obama, you have to close down some factories in the United States because you, you, you're, you're, sort of, you're messing up our climate system up here in the Peruvian Andes. Or perhaps they could send an email to the Chinese. They're Chinese. <laughs> Please, slow down, cool down a bit with your economic development because uh, we're having trouble with our quinoa crops up here. Uh, <laughs> you see what I mean? You feel powerless. If, if the culprit is climate change, uh, you feel you, you've no idea what you're going to do. You have to adjust, or you have to 
yeah, do something else. Um, so that's one example of this growing gap, as it were, between the community and the forces that shape that community. So the, uh, do I have that here, clashing scale? Yes, scale and decision making. Why has it become impossible to confront power with counterpower? I'm not saying that it's impossible, but the distance between people uh, living in communities and the decisions that affect their lives is growing as a result of global overheating. So in other words, the coal miners, I don't know how much you followed the sort of election campaign in America two years ago, but the coal miners in West Virginia who felt that they were being treated disrespectfully by Hillary Clinton and her people from Washington, they were right. I mean, there were many communities she didn't even bother to visit, although she could have done so, because she reckoned that, well, they voted for me anyway, and they didn't. And they felt that they were not being taken seriously. Nobody's listening to me. They're taking decisions which affect my life. I've become unemployed. We have, a, we have a drug problem here. We have crime. You know, we have people who've never had a job, and nobody seems to care. And the powers that be are so far away that they don't even see us. They know nothing about us. Uh, this is becoming a feature of politics everywhere in the world. And in a sense, it's a result of democratization, that people demand their rights. But it's also a result of this growing gap. And let me give you another example of the growing gap from, um, from Australia, where um, there's also a mining company yeah, which pumped out water. Okay, and there were farmers who were complaining. It's a very similar situation, very nice to compare with Peru. Of course, Australia, we think of that as a very different kind of society. It's well organized, people have their rights, it's democratic. Yeah, I guess so, up to a point, but really. Um, in the past, very quickly, in the past, when the farmers had this complaint, they could go to the mining company and they could go into the office and the guy behind the desk, who was a manager of the mine, he was a local because the mining company was a local company called the Queensland Lime and Cement. Uh, and he would say, because he knew you, he would say, yeah, 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 Mr. Smith, I'm taking a note of your complaint and I'll bring you back next week and we'll sort out something. Because he had a moral commitment to the community in which he lived himself, right? He had to be on good terms with his people and he knew them and they were part of the same moral community. Now fast forward to last year or two years ago when I was there doing fieldwork. You walk into the same office, and behind the very same desk, there's another guy. And he's not a local. He's an Englishman who was brought in from New Zealand to run the mine by a much, much larger company now called Cement Australia, because it's been amalgamated, which has its head office somewhere else in Australia. And he would say, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. I understand your complaint, but there's nothing I can do. But you can contact our main office. And then he gives you the email address or the address of the main office. Now that farmer, who's perfectly literate and well-educated, he can do that, but you've no idea how or if they're going to respond because they're so far away and they don't care. They don't live there. They have their office and they have their procedures. It's just as if you have a public hearing about some environmental scandal, which I also do in Australia, and you have these dedicated environmentalists and fishermen and farmers who come in with their complaints and say, look, you have to do things differently because you're destroying the environment and we're losing our livelihood. And then the officials from Queensland government might say, thanks very much for your opinions uh, and for your views. We really appreciate your views and we'll take them with you, with us as we proceed. Do you know what that means? It means that we'll do what we would have done anyway, but we pretend that we're listening to you. So some of these environmentalists, they got so angry in the end that they said, why are you pretending? Why do you even invite us to come to these meetings? Because you know that it doesn't really matter what we say. You have full freedom of expression, but it has no uh, implication, no consequences. So you see, this is not just this pattern of the growing gap between decisions and people are being decided about. Uh, it's not just a question of, uh, it, it doesn't just lead to uh, Islamic fundamentalism and it doesn't just lead to uh, right-wing populism or nationalism. It can also lead to angry environmentalist activism, as it has in Australia. The feeling that nobody takes us seriously. They're not listening to us. So, yeah, so I've, uh, yeah, you've, read, you've read through these uh, already. The crisis of reproduction, of reproducing ourselves in a sensible way. Not the way things have always been, because change, as long as we're partly in control of that change, is fine. 
It's not as if we have to freeze our identities where they were a generation ago. But we have to have the sense that I am in charge, at least to some extent, of my own life, which is becoming more difficult in this situation. Yeah, and then you have this economic argument, which we can discuss later on, which I haven't really gone into. Um, you know, what, what should the economy be? That's a normative question, but it's also a question that can be researched anthropologically. Um, should the economy, uh, should the economy be uh, a tool for making already absurdly rich people even richer? Or should it be a tool for satisfying human needs? I know that's a rhetorical question. But it's a question which is being raised by some rather good anthropologists who now look at alternative economies, not least in southern Europe, after the crisis. Cooperative economies, you know, attempt to, to do things slightly differently and to scale down things, to scale things down a bit. Uh, yeah, I, just one thing, final thing about scale, which also says something about the vulnerabilities in which we live. Um, just one final thing about scale. In a sm small economies struggle very hard to find their niches in a globalized, overheated world economy. One aspect of the globalized world economy that I haven't had the time to go into, go into but which is, forms part of the framework for these struggling local communities, is that of reduced transport costs. I mean, you know, okay, you can, write, you can write a credible history of globalization by looking at the internet, okay? You can look at coal and, uh, and mining. You can even write a credible history of contemporary globalization just by looking at China and Chinese economic development because it's the, it's the engine of the world uh, these days. But you could also write a really interesting history of the contemporary world, a contemporary history of the contemporary world by looking at the container ship. Okay, the, the shipping container, as a key to understanding what's going on. Without the shipping container, there would have been no Chinese economic miracle because it would have been so expensive to move all of that stuff, all of that inexpensive stuff, anything from sporting equipments to electronics to machinery to Barbie dolls and toys uh, from China to the main markets in, in America and Europe. It would have been so expensive that uh, it wouldn't have made sense. It would have been cheaper to produce stuff locally because the transportation costs would have been so much lower. And now that transportation costs, thanks to the shipping container, have been decreased by more than 90% in a little over a generation, since 1970, when the, when the container ship started to take off. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's such a small proportion, transport is such a small proportion of the value of the product that you can, you can move things anywhere in the world and make a profit if you can, if you can produce it sufficiently cheaply. Why am I saying this? Well, I mean, one reason I'm saying this is that I have a current research project that I'd be happy to discuss with anybody over a beer later on. Uh, in a very small economy, the Seychelles, which is an archipelago in the Indian Ocean, 90,000 people, and uh, they're in a situation where it, it's, it's hard, it hardly pays to produce anything. A generation ago, it made sense in a place like the Seychelles to produce lots of different things. Mangoes, coconuts, you could, you know, growing food, you know, producing food made sense. Now it's so much cheaper to get your bananas from South Africa and your mangoes from India that it doesn't really make sense anymore economically, financially, to produce these things locally. So that's also a, 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 a problem of scale. How, in, in a, in a so-called perfectly integrated world economy, at the end of the day, the only place where it's profitable to produce anything at all would in the end be China and possibly India, right? because of the abundance of cheap, skilled labor. So you can produce things at a, at a competitive price. And is this the kind of world we want? Or should we think, dif think differently? And is this the kind of world that people in different communities want? I think we should discuss that afterwards. And I'd be happy to take questions about it as well. How do we respond? What are the reactions at the level of identity and culture to these fast changes? We seem to be washing over us without anybody asking us for our opinion. And finally, this is available. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you can find, uh, um, if you're interested, stuff about overheating at this, on this website, including uh, the e-book called uh, Knowledge and Power, 
in an overheated world, which is about these struggles over um, who has a right to say what, who can I listen to, who can I trust, who can I blame, and what can I do. Okay, so I stop there, and uh, I'd be happy to take your, your questions and comments. <laughs>